one thing that we're beginning to understand is that you know often we've tried to to view autism as a, a single um, category and so people with autism have been offered um, the same kinds of support strategies or interventions and we think that if we can better understand the various different causes of autism perhaps even identify subtypes of autism that might have some shared biological features then we might be able to better target um, intervention or support strategies for individual people. And so in AIMS to Trials, which is a very large uh, multinational collaboration across lots of sites in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world, we're trying to identify those subtypes. So what we're doing is working with babies who have a first degree relative, usually an older sibling with autism. And we know that autism runs in families. Um, and so if you're a baby with an older sibling with autism, you have about a 20% chance of later being diagnosed with autism yourself. And so what we do is um, uh, follow babies from either pregnancy or, you know, close after birth. And we work with them in our in our center looking at their behavior and their brain and their cognitive development and we follow them longitudinally until they're two or three um, and at that age we can determine whether or not they meet criteria for autism so whether they would be diagnosed with autism um, and then we can look back at the data we collected earlier to try to understand what's different in cognition and in the brain um, of infants who go on to, to autism or not, but, but particularly different, um, different experiences of autism. And we're also following children into to later childhood to look at things like anxiety or depression or um, ADHD related challenges, because we know they can be very important for autistic people. So for a typical child who's in our study, they might um, come into the study, say when they're three to five months old, um, some babies will join before that during pregnancy, so we might do some um, fetal scanning, so looking at um, the development of the brain, even when the baby's in the womb. Um, but then when they're born, they come to our, um, our baby lab, as we call it, at our center. Um, at several times during during infancy and when they come in they typically come for the whole day they come with their family and we do lots of different games with them um, and our whole protocol is designed to be fun and engaging because of course they're babies you know they don't want to do boring things so we do things like um, what we call sort of cognitive testing so we might look for you know can they find a ball under a cup we look at their language skills, so what can they name, what do they understand. We take measures of their brain, so we use EEG, which measures um, the sort of activity of lots and lots of neurons in their brain. And it's just like recording your voice with a, um, a, a, a tape recorder. So like I'm being recorded now, um, it's completely non-invasive. It just measures sort of the natural activity that, that happens in babies' head when they watch you know, videos of women or videos of toys. Um, and we use eye tracking where we measure what their eyes are looking at while we show them, again, like fun videos and, and pictures and things. Um, and then we can put all of that information together to try to look at, you know, what that baby's interested in, how their brain's working and how that relates to these, um, these later skills that we look at when they're older. And so most babies will come um, into our centre for that kind of day. Um, at five months, 10 months, 12, 14 months, and then at two and three. And broadly, they do the same kinds of things um, at every age. Uh, some of the activities change as they get older. So, you know, for a three-year-old, we're testing more complicated language activities than for the babies. But broadly speaking, the range of things we do is the same. And that's so that we can look at their development longitudinally so that we can see how their responses are changing to the same set of activities over that developmental time window. So we found these sort of early infant um, signs that we think relate to, to later anxiety. Um, and what those signs are is actually quite simple. So it's parent report of the child's um, fearfulness in infancy. So, you know, how afraid are they of new people or new places or um, unusual experiences? And we know that, you know, lots of babies are afraid of those things um, and go on to, to not develop anxiety. 
But what we're seeing is that for some infants, particularly infants, you know, with older siblings with autism, if they're showing some of those early fearful behaviors, some of those babies will go on to, um, to have significant anxiety later on. And so what we're wanting to do now is think about how we can use that information to design better support strategies. So can we, for example, help parents to respond to those early fears in a way that um, makes kids less anxious when they get older? And our, our studies are still running. So we're still looking for families who want to participate. Um, we, we're looking for families with uh, a parent or um, an older child with autism or ADHD and a, and a baby under the age of 10 months. And at the moment, because of coronavirus, we're doing online questionnaires and home videos, but we're really hoping to get back into our, our center soon. Um, and at that point, families will you know, come back to us when it's safe for them to do so, to participate in our studies. Um, so if you're interested, we'd love to hear from you.